Yeah, so I guess in terms of looking at what makes um, a kind of a beautiful uh, tech thing an artwork, that's, uh, yeah, so I guess, yeah, sometimes I feel I'm neither really an expert in the technology nor in the art, but um, certainly um, kind of in terms of my practice or what I um, kind of f find uh, interesting, I always think that um, the meaning or the importance of an artwork is kind of partly made by the artist and partly assigned by other parties. So there will be the art critic that will come and kind of make references and kind of create a narrative around it. There is a curator who will place it in a particular kind of context. And um, yes, yeah, so if you take all of these cool tech things and you like, come up with a narrative around them, then they will just stand as well in an art context as all these other kind of artist initiated pieces. That's my view. Um, yeah, I, I think kind of like very similar to the, I think a lot of it is about context. So I think it was interesting you showed the Kyoto um, imagery, which it, 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 yeah, so but in like the context that you show, showed it, it's very much kind of like technical and kind of scientific, but it's also the basis of the Pierre Hugues um, exhibition in the Serpentine, and kind of by placing it in that context and kind of designing the space and kind of reconfiguring it, it very much is an art piece, even though it's the same imagery. I don't know, it's exactly the same imagery, but just by kind of like taking it and putting the intent and putting that narrative around it, it changes it from being a tech demo to being an artwork. And that's where I think that chart that you showed is so interesting and so problematic because it, it's so much of it is context and audience dependent. I just wanted to add in terms of this Pierre Eger um, installation that I think the thing about it that very obviously makes it an artwork is the fact that uh, for some reason they have put lots of flies in the space, which um, I think to somebody who is who might not always be familiar with with the contemporary art world or with uh, the particular work of this artist would seem kind of uh, very bizarre, but that is the the type of kind of value and. Uh, artistic intention and kind of link to an individual practice that an artist uh, can provide. Because if you see these images kind of very cold, it's like the same as some kind of, yeah, another demo that was produced by somebody else's research. Um, so what, <coughs> uh, what I also find interesting about, uh, especially this example maybe, is that um, in science, but also in like critique, cultural critique, and the context of contemporary art, there are two ways of dealing with complexity. One is the mathematical one from the realm of science, but uh, in um, in the art world, there's also a kind of complexity around uh, knowledge production and um, language itself. So. Uh, that's also the interesting part about this dialogue for me between these two kinds of complexity where also in science I see um, exponential growth in that like in the beginning we built fire which is like okay, burning but then <laughs> machines are <laughs> and I mean it's not that simple but the machines that humans built uh, later got more and more complex for us at least I mean we can't explain fire to the very ground but um, and now with uh, AI technologies there are powerful algorithms which are black boxes that even the people that who build them don't understand fully and maybe you could elaborate a bit about those two different kinds of complexity. Yeah, yeah okay, then I first have to put my anthropogeny hat on and say like fire is pretty good. It's so like, for, like for example this stone napping that I showed, it's really difficult, you know? Like it takes people hundreds of hours to get this right, and same with fire, no, no. But, it, but this, and, and this is interesting idea that maybe these things that look fairly uh, basic, you know, or foundational, 
Yeah. Or like, the, let's say, let's put it another way. So like the, um, there's always this progression of things that, at some, the, there's technological things which at some point don't register as technology anymore. You know, and fire is one of them. So I mean, it's obviously a chemical reaction, but in the way that early humans use this, it's clearly technological. It's like the foundation of a lot of other technologies, right? So, but we don't, we wouldn't consider the technology anymore, which is really interesting, right? And and you can probably think that, um, and and then what happens, right? Does it just enter this complexity of um, these general, the general intellect, right? Does it does it become part of the human realm, right? How does it become part of the human realm? Um, and language is a funny one as well because language is almost. Um, mm, yeah, we in we in so okay we internalize things, but we also externalize things, right? So this this is interesting thing that, that I've been kind of working with this idea that, that that in a way like fire for example is an externalized fire allowed us to externalize one of our bodily functions, right? So f the cooking is essentially an externalized organ. Right, which allows you to kind of like do an organic thing outside of your body and then gives you a bigger brain, right? Because you have to spend less energy on, you don't have to chew the whole day, basically. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's as basic as that, right? So, um, <coughs> um, and many in language arguably emerged because of that, or like partially emerged because of that, because you just had more energy available to kind of like then create the neocortex, right? Um, I'm not the neocortex, but like the higher. I mean, when I say higher, it's like it sounds like judgmental, but like functions that are not available to many non-human animals. Um, um, okay, what do I want to say? Um, and so there's like many ways this complexity, these complexities move, um, you know, and and how they kind of like go in and out of our realm as humans, um, which deserves a complex look at them. I know, I'm sorry, this is a really complicated answer. <laughs> no, I just wanted to pick up something that you were talking about, about language, because I think, thinking of, because lam language is deeply complex, and thinking about how language is evolving in relation to kind of like, both kind of like our interactions with these machines and how it's developing, you know, that, that kind of like the point that you were talking about, the Facebook AI bots, kind of like how natural language isn't natural, I think is really interesting. And I think, so one of the things that I, struck me when I was kind of like doing work around, when I was like labeling all of my tulips is that it, even though to me, understands what pink is or what red is or what yellow is it doesn't understand it in the same way that we understand it um, kind of like all of these models just look for patterns and so the concepts of kind of like what these words mean are totally different which I think is like very interesting that it's kind of like that a language is developing this like non-human language is developing which is just conceptually so different to how we use language Um, yes, yeah, so I've always kind of felt that there was um, quite a lot of uh, difference between the, the two spheres. So the um, yeah the technologically minded research community, which has uh, kind of you know a goal of beating the latest benchmark and producing uh, more interesting results, and then you have uh, the artistic world uh, that um, well the media art world of course uh, likes to. Um, uh, yeah, I guess look at various political and uh, social topics and uh, create new knowledge associated with that, uh, which is frequently, to me, uh, presented in a very complex and uh, not very easily understandable um, manner, but this is probably uh, true of the technical community too. Um, but yeah, I was recently writing um, an essay about some artists who work in the field and um, I would probably kind of 
write it in, in my usual style, uh, highlighting the uh, aspects that are most important to me. So kind of the process, how was it made? And then um, it was more from for, for an artistically minded editor. And um, some of the comments that I received was that like the, the, there was still kind of not enough, um, I think, visual language or, or description. Um, around it and then it kind of hit me that of course the people in that world are like very much concerned about the are often frequently still about the artistic vision whereas I don't know the, the people I surround myself with they are kind of much more interested in often like the process and what was kind of new there so it's just yeah figuring out sometimes how to bridge those two fields and kind of still carry over what what you find important Uh, picking up the the idea of um, externalizing parts of ourselves and the um, mm, popular question of when um, when an algorithm be can become an artist or something um, I think the um, the idea that you explained of how we have more time to spend on something because we are externalizing our stomach or our chewing and cooking. Um, it reminds me of the way artificial intelligence or machine learning is developed for like specific tasks at the moment, where you externalize small bits of the human, first of mechanics maybe, of like grabbing, but also of mind, mind function. And then there's this idea of mm, this landscape of uh, evolution where the water level is constantly rising, and on the lowest part, there was uh, chess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's from another uh, few, maybe, but in the, the, this maybe chess, and it's already underwater, and Go was underwater, and self-driving uh, driving is under the water of this, of this island, and on the top, there's the mountain of science and art, maybe, which is the last thing where the water will, will rise to. And so as a hypothesis, maybe I would uh, say that when the moment when algorithms can create art, that then it's that moment of like merging of human brain and machine capacities that they are on the same level. Um, that's a challenging question. Mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, did, like, I, I, I like this idea of the landscape, right? But then I would I would like to know what the landscape, like, yeah, what does like what does the landscape look like? Um, I would personally be more concerned if uh, the AI becomes a judge than an artist, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or because um, this is I mean this is. So I mean, we find these things terribly interesting, right? But there's like a like the danger, obviously, is if you. So like, I would totally agree that there's been a su succession of externalizations. That, for example, the industrial revolution was the, or like the, not externalization, but a. Like a severing of, like, um, mechanic mechanical movements, right? So like the the arm became the machine, basically now part of the brain and you, you I mean not it's not the the brain it's like a very specific interpretation of what the brain does that happens to also do something if it's not connected to a brain right so that's so that's that's I mean the, the thing you have to like keep in mind is that like the, these neural networks are very specific they're like in the contemporary reading of what goes on in our head that kind of works right um, but it, it's not the whole thing so it's it's missing many dimensions and people who are trying to develop better neural networks, for example, acknowledge that that's the case. You know, you're working with a caricature, basically, that, that has agency. Um, but um, so the next step would be to, to actually do that with cognitive abilities, all right? But the fact that you don't really know how your own cognitive abilities fully work, and then you end up with something that does something that might, so it might be doing it in the same way, it might not be doing it in the same way. Right, so you get this this um, multiple reali re realizability idea that like maybe it maybe it does it in a totally different way, but it does it. 
but the fact that you don't know how it does it, that it, you know, become it's very com it's 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 pr very problematic knowledge that you get because, you know, how how are you going to how are you, how are you going to judge it? Which is obviously the the <coughs> now very like popular example with the self-driving cars that you know how are gonna, how are they going to make decisions? I think well you know they, they do you know. <laughs> <laughs> but that's probably not good enough if you actually want to include them in a legal framework that basically comes with ethical decisions and with with or that comes with moral assumptions and which is like the most boring example but it's also very important because it means that you know like how do we how do we relate to these technologies that, that basically embody that embody certain kind of things about ourselves as well right um and the, the example of the recognition um, that, that one of you just said was kind of interesting. So I, m I remember this um, <coughs> example of um, Jean Cogan showing a teacup in front of a <coughs> in front of a camera, and the neural network somehow knew um, what the teacup was. Right. So yeah, the two. Um, um, but but do we need to know how it knows that? Right. Like, does it, is it important to include, include it in our human practices that we know how it knows? All right. Can we deal with the fact that something knows in a different way than we do? Um, I think that's one of the main questions that, that need to be answered more urgently than if it can do art. <laughs> um, I suppose, kind of, to go back to your question, although I, I totally agree with all of your comments about concerns about that there are maybe more urgent concerns than art. But to go back to your, the point that you were making about chess being underwater and then go being underwater, is that so a computer beat a human at chess decades ago, but people still play chess. And in many ways, kind of like the ability to play chess with a computer has kind of like aided people's enjoyment of playing chess and the ability to kind of like practice by yourself and developing new moves and all of that kind of thing. And so I think if an algorithm can produce art and there's no, that that goes back to this whole thorny question of what is art, where is it, who, where is, does the intention lie? I don't necessarily see that as a threat. I see it as maybe kind of a, like, I think the idea of art might change or kind of like how people make art might change. But I don't see it as kind of like the, this curtain coming down and human art being over forever. I think it will just, it will, which is kind of like how your question was set up. Um, I think things will just evolve and it's difficult to see where that evolution will go. But I'm not necessarily fearful for that evolution. Yeah, I think there'll always be kind of a need and opportunity for human artists because um, a lot of, um, from what I understand, is valued kind of nowadays in the media art space is art that is critical in terms of the problems and the issues of society. So once we do have this kind of underwater world with an artist and kind of cyborg head sticking out, then um, <laughs> I don't know, the issues might be different. So I'm sure if there are some human artists alive, then they will... Um, create art that is kind of relevant to this kind of submerged world that, that is rather than kind of the, the problems we're discussing now. Um, but yeah, certainly kind of if you look at um, art that is used as maybe decoration, <laughs> which is, well, yeah, well, well yeah, uh, then uh, if, if, if that can be uh, generated, I guess, more easily than, uh, um, yeah, the artists who work in that field will be displaced to an extent. Um, yeah, and then kind of just going back to your point of uh, if we need to understand how the AI knows if a teacup is a teacup, um, I think, yeah, it's also kind of, uh, it also kind of reminds me of what you said earlier about fire, right? So. Um, I'm not sure if all of us here in this room can actually explain how a fire, like, how it occurs right now, but I'm sure we've probably been taught at some point in school. And, um, uh, but yeah, but we don't tend to kind of uh, remember how it works uh, because 
it, it works, and that's what we're kind of interested in. And with a lot of this AI-related technology, a lot of the time it doesn't work perfectly, which uh, I think part of the, the reason that we're quite interested as to kind of what can we do to, um, to advance it further. It's a really, it's a, yeah. Um, one of the things, I mean, as an industrial process, often it has to do with money as well, right? So often an art, like art, art, as like a social game, an investment game, is maybe also too high level an example, I think, to look at these things. But if you look at design or decorative things, then, then often, I mean, the water level is going to be determined by if the AI is doing something more cheaply than a human. Right. And and because that's in, if you look at it, um, most technological advances they're determined by um, essentially cost to efficiency. Right. And it's a beautiful paper about the cost of light and by the guy who just got the Nobel um, in economics by how the cost of light has decreased over the course of um, the last couple hundred thousand years. I mean, since fire basically. It's an accidental connection, but. Um, and, and there's a lot to <laughs> fire base. Um, there's, there's, um, there's a lot to learn from that, I think, because because many of these things, then like once you hook them up with um, systems like that, then become cheaper by an order of magnitude, right? So like a self-driving car, it's typically ten times cheaper than an Uber, which is ten times cheaper than a normal cab. You know, so you get two orders of magnitude with a self-driving car, which means that the beige cab driver is out of work twice already by the time when the <laughs> self-driving Uber hits, you know? And it's and it, it sounds really banal and really kind of like businessy, but that's how these things have worked forever, right? And then I think that's the, the lens to look at them. And art, like art, art has a very privileged position because, because it's a different kind of game, you know? It's not about how cheap it is to make something, but it's about like how much value you put in a certain object and how much value you attach, you attach to that individual who makes it. Right? And then it's essentially up to the people who buy it, you know, who they want to bet on. I mean, that's like my cynical view of art, but, but I think this, <laughs> so the Sotheby's thing was probably quite good proof for that because the, the people invested in this novelty because it was a novelty, you know? So I think that's, that's the main thing that, that went on there. Um, anyway. If there's any question in the audience, this. Yeah, the question is for Manuel. Manuel, do you have a problem with art? Do you want to get rid? Of, you want to get rid of art? You have some intentions to really just the art the way we know, um, because um, I believe that's the most irrelevant question ever for art and artists. Where is art? And just because involving the whole thing in the process of science and design, that's basically what you guys are researching. Um, for example, um, with Anna, you work because it's so related with us um, painting and drawings, and you choose to work with film. Um, how that is today relevant for the uh, whatever we're thinking about the world and things that are um, because the, then uh, with the language that you find also important how how you feel that is relevant for now today uh, so first uh, to 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 um, answer you you question the point where, where I was heading towards was not like to get rid of art, but to link the importance of art to the to being human, and following this idea of externalizing things, uh, it's a bit it's probably the, the model doesn't work at all. But if you imagine uh, the human being as a mix of capacities that you externalize that are linked with each other, of course, but uh, capaci capacities that you externalize, then if we reach a point where we put the capacity of creating art into a machine, 
then we are either on the same level or empty. You know what I mean? Yeah, but so, so what I want, wanted to point out with that is that when we reach that point, it's like another discussion. So, because that's the, the vanishing point of the, of the machine like talking in the same way that, that you do and understanding the same things. Because I think that to create art, you, you need to understand the whole, or at least uh, large parts of uh, society of what it means to be human and stuff. And when we reach a point, when a machine can do that, um, the boundaries are falling. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying that it's going to happen, but yeah. Can I ask a question to Luba? So in the very beginning, you had this, um, you had this, um, this slide that, that showed how the person gets to like the Blade Runner piece, how the person got into legal trouble. Um, what, I what I would like to know is that the, um, who, who was um, giving him trouble? Was it the people who made Blade Runner or was it the people who made the films that he based, the, yeah. that he trained the network on? Well, actually, I should figure the microphone. Um, yeah, so actually it was, I think it was Vimeo YouTube so um, when he wanted to upload, yeah, when Terry Broad wanted to upload his kind of finished uh, creation of this item called Blade Runner, um, he received, I think, notices from Vimeo um, that I, I think maybe from Warner Brothers or whoever kind of, um, I guess, owned the rights to, to the film. Um, yeah, so it's kind of that, but it's, what, what really strikes me as really out of it is that they might just as well sue somebody for watching the film, right? Because you have a machine that watches the film, then generates something secondary or ter tertiary yeah. out of it, you know? Like on what grounds, because it's, like it's a neural interpretation of something, which is, you know? Yeah, like on what grounds do you decide, yeah. like... Like whether to issue somebody a copyright notice, and I think in terms of uh, in, in that particular case, um, it was because I think these like YouTube or Vimeo uh, systems they use some sort of um, kind of algorithm that figure out how similar something is, and because the um, the reconstructed version of Blade Runner was well, I think quite similar in in the machine's eye to um, the original version. It could be interpreted as an illegal kind of bootleg that was, you know, filmed in uh, in a cinema or something like that. Okay, that's even crazier. Which means that one computer thought that the other's computer rem memory <laughs> of something is too similar to the original. Yes. Okay. <laughs> great. <laughs> Not great. Um, another question from the audience? Just a, a very quick, a very spontaneous thought. What do you think about the scenario that maybe in some future time um, art as we discuss it, as you guys discuss it right there, is becoming something which is completely being apart from the human situation? Like, art will take place in the computers. That's the thought you just um, pointed out um, about the computer watching the computer and assaulting each other about whatever infringements might have happened. Brings me to this idea that this might be apart from each other completely. And the humans will go back to get some brushes, get some colors, draw their, treat their papers and things like that. That's the question. <laughs> I think there's two answers to that, or, uh, or maybe two thoughts. What, what you imagine is almost an inverse of what many people believe is what happened with photography, right? That photography 
essentially liberated, um, or like f photography partially made possible more abstract painting because it, you know, it relieved the need to paint realistically. I'm sure there's many different interpretations of that, but there's like one popular reading that then people kind of did other things because the naturalistic thing was, you know, photography, painting by nature. Um, but but you imagine the opposite that maybe the higher the higher level thing kind of like moves somewhere else, and then we go back to you know. I'm I'm just reading, but but the other thing I think that like what what can constantly keeps hovering above this conversation is that I think art is something that we, that humans do, you know, and maybe computers do art, but it might be something totally different, you know. We might not even notice them doing it, you know. Maybe they're doing it right now. You know, but but the kind of the art that we do is like inherently a human thing, and it's also something. It's a human. It's a human social technique. It's a part of human sociality, right? And and I don't like how would that not be human in a s sense? But but also, um, um, it's really cr related to our identity, right? As a species, in a sense, you know. And it's very old as well, right? It's so old. Like if you, there was this finding the other day of like yet another older drawing of an animal um, and and like why would that get cut off but the anxiety that comes from it is probably because it's so constitutive to human identity right it actually shows how important it is to us that we even talk about these things right which probably means that they're not going to go away but they might change, right? So they might. So in the, I think the games example was quite good. So many of the many of the games that computers have started playing, or we have started playing with computers, have changed a lot. So poker, for example, has changed a lot because people play with algorithms online. So the human-to-human -human interaction part of poker, the whole kind of like poker face thing, <laughs> in professional poker, apparently, like I know as little about poker as I know about Go. Um, but has apparently become much less important, right? So the, the nature of the game has changed, same with chess, same with Go. Already Go has apparently changed a lot as a game. Um, so maybe the way that we do these things as a cultural identity discussion technique are going to change, but I don't think they're going to push us back and, or push us into um, a certain direction because that it's something that we do, right? to that which again I agree with is that I think especially when you talk about our art um, <laughs> like there is like painting and drawing are both kind of like nouns and verbs so you have an object that is a painting and a drawing which a machine may be able to produce but then you also have the act of drawing and the act of painting which are kind of like they are a process and you know they're involving things like memory and editing and history and emphasis and you know so if I was to do a drawing of this room I would choose to emphasize certain things and I could kind of like put multiple points of time in and you know edit things out and all you know like there's this the, when you talk about kind of like the act of drawing there are all of these different things that go on and so I think maybe your question is will machines be able to produce drawings as objects or paintings as objects and where it is, I think there's also this question about kind of like, can they do the act of drawing? Can they do the act of painting? Which then goes back to whatever um, the conversation we were having earlier about, like whether this will ever be possible because you do need so much kind of knowledge of the world and knowledge of kind of humanity and intent to kind of do that act. On the one hand, of course, algorithms are biased based on data sets, but from another point of view, maybe they are, in certain cases, less biased than humans are. If you think of uh, projections in the future, for example, in movies, you always see um, spaceships hunting each other with like the captain telling people what to do, which is already far from reality, how we know it today, because who's going to drive a spaceship when cars are already driving by themselves? Um, so clearly our image of the future is probably biased and I was wondering um, how you think maybe we can use algorithms to, to go a step beyond our own uh, imagination or boundaries and maybe 
that's a question for you, Sasha, and for Anna, maybe further elaborate about this idea of judging in your, in your words. Uh, complicated. I mean, that is it clearly puts the idea of like an Uber enterprise into my head. <laughs> like, no Kirk, just algorithm. Um, but I mean, the underlying thing, um, it, it's, it's not finished as a work, I think. Um, and, and we kind of, so like, I mean, there's many ways to like answer this, I guess, but um, it's a complicated work because we wanted something from people that they completely didn't do because we caught them in the wrong moment or maybe in a good moment, which means that um, we wanted people to do something. Um, so this was in New York City last December and we wanted the, our very kind and amazing participants of this workshop to like come up with these like 1960s, you know, uh, Yoko Ono algorithms, which they completely ignored because all they did was about political bias and racial bias and unlearning being like a bad human basically and by kind of like excluding people from, you know, excluding other humans, um, which then we had to work with, right? But, but I think in a sense, what the point they were trying to make is much stronger, right? That like how, how do you unlearn, um, how do you unlearn the, the, the kind of problematic things? So that's a lot of work already. Right. Um, how do you how do you unlearn the things that the people are doing, which they shouldn't be doing? Um, but then, you know, it's a pretty gigantic task actually to identify these things and actually, you know, as as you beautifully showed in your work, like how you how do you actually make sure that. Um, they, they don't transfer in, into these data sets, right? Which tend to be, I mean, these old data sets are incredible. They're just like, um, you know, Western scientists from the 90s, almost like a huge majority of data in science is generated by American college students, right? Because they are the available population to gather data from, you know? So there's so much bias in these existing data sets, you know, and it's, it's gonna be very difficult to kind of like get that out of out of there because it, but, and it's it's not possible to not have it because it's you know it's it's all about decision making so the whole that's why the games are interesting as well because the like computer science as complicated subject but but I mean many of these things are structured around questions of decision making right like decision making problems like when. You know, when are we going to launch the missiles? You know, so like that's a lot of these questions are framed around these things. So, so um, there's always decisions that are being made, and the decisions are being made at different, at different spots. So even like, so what to put into the data set is a design decision that's really important. And I think you cannot fully evade these decisions. And then even if you evade the dis like even if you can not evade, but even if you if you escape from the decision, then the decision is going to come back in the real world when the car is being faced in the trolley dilemma situation, right? So there's always a moment when decisions have to be made and the, the task will be to design systems that are equitable in a human sense. Um, how to do that is a task for this century, I guess, like seriously. And, um, and maybe art can actually contribute to that by proposing things that could work in this way. I mean, that's kind of what we're trying to do. But, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's not answerable as a question, I think, because it's such a, but it's really important to be aware of that, especially for the computer engineers or the computer scientists. And the, this knowledge is definitely creeping in and it's probably also creeping in because of the work that artists are doing in the field. So that's actually, and then, I mean, people like Luba, who has been <coughs> championing these approaches to actually the computer science community. Um, this may be sad to pass on the question, but do you, how do how do they react to that? The people who are actually building the algorithms, do they? How receptive are people to the to these problems being brought up? Um, good question. Um, yeah, so I, I would agree with you that um, kind of yeah, artists do a lot of great work. Almost, what's the right word? Kind of testing the system. To, to, like, to see how they actually work in uh, other contexts uh, beyond those originally designed by the, the researchers. 
Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so kind of from uh, from my impression, working with uh, with the research and technological community, and my own interests, which are more kind of recent uh, uh, interests, which is more of an interest around kind of the aesthetics of art versus its kind of critical importance in uh, in society. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I think. Uh, I think yeah, they find it beneficial to kind of broaden their mind uh, um, to see that some of the research they produce uh, can do things that's beyond pretty images with pretty images with deep dream and style transfer. But I think um, nowadays the art world is uh, so complicated, and uh, unless you um, have some knowledge or education as to act, what actually new media art entails, uh, you would probably find all these kind of uh, exhibitions um, or sometimes kind of challenging to your, your individual concept of what uh, art is. Because of course, um, if you're somebody who has not much interest in art, then you do think it's all like pretty pictures. You don't realize it can also be kind of performances or kind of web experiences, installations and so on. So, um, yeah, I guess you have to kind of figure out if it's worth to bring that part of the discussion or to just kind of maybe um, connect them more with uh, the artists and kind of the, the more the reasoning and the intent behind the artistic practice, which can actually be, I think, almost better communicated through artist talks uh, than kind of, um, kind of physical installations. I don't know if that kind of answers your question, but... Uh, yeah, with that in mind, I think we're approaching lunch and uh, in the afternoon, another talk.